All right, welcome back everyone. Glad you're here. Today we're gonna to be talking about hospital-acquired pneumonia. Now, if you remember, uh, I posted a video about community-acquired pneumonia uh, a few weeks ago, and so I didn't really encourage you to take a look at that and to compare and contrast different empiric antibiotic choices uh, and really definitions between CAP, community-acquired pneumonia, and HAP, or hospital-acquired pneumonia. Now, a little bit first on nomenclature. Uh, if you're like me and you did residency something like five years ago or so, you might remember a, uh, a terminology called HCAP or healthcare associated pneumonia. And this was a pneumonia that was acquired in the community. The patient acquired it in the community, but uh, the patient had lots of um, maybe healthcare exposures. Maybe they were on hemodialysis. Maybe they were in a wound care center. Maybe they were on IV antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera. It was really kind of difficult to remember all of those different uh, categories of what the patient you know, could meet. Um, and so the latest guidelines took that out and it said, really, we're gonna recognize community acquired pneumonia, we're gonna recognize hospital acquired pneumonia, and we're gonna recognize ventilator associated pneumonia, okay? So there's no more HCAP when we're um, presenting our patients, okay? It's CAP or it's HAP. So hospital acquired pneumonia, first we have to define what this is. And of course, it's a pulmonary infection, a pulmonary parenchymal infection, but the time frame is really important. So this is pneumonia that's occurring greater than or equal to 48 hours post-admit that was not brewing on admission, okay? And so this is really important because a patient who develops pneumonia 24 hours into their hospital stay, we're really thinking more along the lines of community-acquired pneumonia. So HAP, uh, pneumonia 48 hours or more after uh, hospital admission, okay? So the first thing that we wanna be able to do then is put patients into different categories. Now, I say this and I want you to understand that while we're talking about guidelines, guidelines are just that, they're just there to guide us. We have to take each patient individually. So while I'm gonna set up some different buckets for you, I want you to be critically thinking about your patient when you see uh, him or her, okay? Uh, and that's really, really important when we talk about empiric choices and, and you know what we choose. So, what we've got to do is put them into a couple of different buckets to start. The first one is what's called a low risk bucket. The second bucket, you guessed it, high risk bucket. Wow, I'm like blowing your mind right now. What this really means is what's your risk factor for death, right? How sick is the patient? And so high risk patients are gonna be those who are mechanically ventilated or in septic shock. That's pretty easy, right? So I'm gonna put over here mechanical ventilation or septic shock, okay? And we're gonna, these are patients who are in the ICU. We're gonna treat them a little bit differently now because we don't, we don't see them every single day. Uh, and it's more common that patients are gonna live over here. We'll hit on them briefly, okay? So most patients are gonna be low risk for death. And that just means they're not mechanically ventilated and they're not in septic shock, okay? Now, the second thing that we have to do in this category is we have to understand, really in any of this, is that any empiric regimen for hospital-acquired pneumonia has to cover for two organisms. Think about what those are, I'll give you five seconds. What are those organisms that we empirically have to cover for? Pseudomonas, I know you got that right. And probably most of you are thinking MRSA. And you might be right, you might not be right. It's Staph aureus, okay? And the decision to treat for MRSA or just MSSA is gonna be based on your patient-specific risk factors for MRSA, okay? So any empiric regimen, empiric regimen, no matter what we are over here, uh, but we're talking about low risk, here is any empiric regimen has to cover for pseudomonas and staph aureus. And the decision to treat for MSSA or MRSA is going to be based on your patient specific risk factors for them. Okay? It's also going to be based on your hospital institution and whether your staph isolates if over 20% of them are MRSA. I'm going to say that again. Not only does it depend on your MRSA specific patient risk factors, right? So have I been on IV antibiotics, you know, within the last uh, three months? 
do I have a previous MRSA infection over the past year, right? It also depends on your hospital that you're seeing this patient in. If over 20%, if over 20% of your staph isolates are actually MRSA, and you can find this on your antibiogram, then by definition, we should be empirically treating for MRSA and pseudomonas, okay? Does that make sense? So we're gonna cover for pseudomonas empirically no matter what, we're gonna cover for staph aureus no matter what, whether it's MRSA or MSSA depends on patient and hospital, whatever your hospital's at, those risk factors, okay? So anytime you treat somebody for hospital acquired pneumonia, you wanna find the organism. So you're gonna do blood cultures, you're gonna do sputum cultures, right? Because you're gonna be treating with broad agents. So you wanna be able to narrow antibiotics down after 48 hours, right? We know that pseudomonas, we know that staph aureus grow really, really well on sputum culture, right? On blood cultures, right? So if you get a really good sputum culture, you should be able to see pseudomonas, you should be able to see staph aureus relatively quickly. And if you don't, then that's grounds to, to narrow if you can, okay? And that's not, you know, just for half, that's for any kind of antibiotic, right? So if I'm low risk over here, then I've got to say I'm low MRSA risk factors, or I do have MRSA risk factors. So this is our second branch point. Do I want to empirically cover for MRSA or do I not want to empirically cover for MRSA? So if I'm not empirically covering for MRSA, then I'm covering for Pseudomonas and Staph aureus, MSSA. Now there are five antibiotics that we can choose from that will do this, okay? Now I want you to think about those five over the next 10 seconds and see if you can hit them all with me, all right? All right, it's like five seconds, okay. So, Pseudomonas MSSA. Remember, this is a pulmonary infection. So, levofloxacin. Now, a lot of these are gonna be based on your antibiograms too. You know, if you have an antibiogram at your hospital and levofloxacin is awful there, you probably wouldn't wanna use that, right? But I'm giving you options. So you can do levofloxacin, you can do Pipercillin Tazobactam, right? Staph aureus, MSSA, Pseudomonas. You can do Cefepime. If you wanted to go really broad, and I would not suggest this right off the bat, but I'm giving you options, is you can do something like Imipenem. And Imipenem is always connected to Celastin. Or you can do something like Meropenem. Why didn't I say ciprofloxacin? Well, ciprofloxacin has poor gram positive coverage. It wouldn't cover MSSA, right? Why didn't I say ertapenem? Well, ertapenem misses pseudomonas, right? Okay, so I'm not covering for MRSA, I'm covering for pseudomonas and I'm covering for MSSA. Easy breezy stuff, I know you got all of those right, okay? Now, if they're low risk and they are MRSA risk factors, so they do have MRSA risk factors, this is the easy part. You can just extrapolate this data here. You could take all these antibiotics and now you would just add something to cover for MRSA because you're still covering for empirically for Pseudomonas. So what are our two empiric uh, pulmonary uh, MRSA agents? Vancomycin or linazolid. Why didn't I say daptomycin? Why is daptomycin not in here? It covers MRSA, right? Well, remember, daptomycin is inhibited by pulmonary surfactant, so I cannot use it in the, in the, setting, of, uh, in the setting of pneumonia. So this part's really easy, right? You just add vancomycin or you add linazolid. Now, you actually can add a couple of different antibiotics here if you wanted to. You could use something like septazidine, Maybe even if you had a big bad allergy, two beta lactams you could use as trionam. And the way that you would use these is if you're already using vancomycin or you're using linazolin, you've already got your MRSA imperatively covered for, right? You've got your gram positives covered for. But now I can use septazidine, which covers pseudomonas, but doesn't have much gram positive activity. 
or as trionam, which is really only gram-negative aerobes, including pseudomonas. So it gives you a little bit more options to cover your empirically to cover for, for pseudomonas. Okay. Now, vancomycin is usually going to be the, the one that we go for. I will give you a board exam pearl, and that is if ever you see an isolate of, of MRSA that has an MIC or a minimum inhibitory concentration of two or more to vancomycin, then that's associated with treatment failures, and it would be grounds to change your antibiotic. Okay. In this case, we would do, you know, you could do something like linazolib, but you would have a culture insensitivity to, to, to change that. Okay. All right. So does that make sense? Easy breezy so far? Treatment is, is, is seven days. So we would treat, unless, you know, somebody's MRSA bacteremic or, you know, pseudomonas bacteremia, something like that. Um, you know, seven days of treatment is, is, is really going to be what's uh, recommended for um, patients with hospital acquired pneumonia. Now your high risk, I'll say this, is that your high risk is their mechanically ventilated or in septic shock. What we want to do in this category is we want to do two anti-pseudomonal agents. Remember, we're talking about empiric therapy here again. Remember, I cannot stress this enough. Anytime you're covering for MRSA or pseudomonas, you've got a hospital acquired infection, even in community acquired pneumonia. Remember, go back and watch that video. If we're ever using vancomycin or we're using an anti-pseudomonal agent, we have to get blood cultures and sputum cultures because we need to narrow those antibiotics down. We want to be great antimicrobial stewards, right? So if you're high risk, your empiric therapy is going to be two different anti-pseudomonal agents plus an anti-MRSA agent, okay? Now, usually we would go uh, with two different anti-pseudomonal agents from different classes, okay? That's always gonna be your, your, your best to decrease the resistance. Um, and we would do an anti-MRSA agent, so vancomycin um, or, or linazolid, not daptomycin, okay? Okay. That's hospital-acquired pneumonia. Now go ahead and compare that to community-acquired pneumonia. Go back and watch that video um, and, and you can kind of make these connections in your mind and why you're using certain antibiotics uh, and why you're not. Okay? All right, thanks guys.